When Alexander the Great died in 323 BCE, his leading generals, known as the Diadochi, entered into a critical struggle for dominance of his empire. This began with the first partition of Babylon. It is said that this partition was first proposed by one Ptolemy of Macedon, son of Lagos. Ptolemy was close to Alexander, being one of his most respected generals, as well as the leader of the Epigonoi, his Persian royal guard, and himself a Sormathophulax, a high-ranking bodyguard picked from the Macedonian nobility to be a constant part of Alexander's inner circle. And this same Ptolemy went on to enjoy possibly the most magnificent legacies of all Alexander's successors. He founded the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt, which lasted nearly 300 years. He became the first pharaoh of a great Hellenistic kingdom, which stretched across North Africa and the Middle East. He established the famous Library of Alexandria, and himself wrote extensively, including a history of Alexander's campaigns, which, while lost, can be glimpsed clearly through later authors. He even sponsored the pioneering mathematician Euclid, whose seminal work The Elements, or Stoicheia, were a core part of mathematical curricula for over 2,000 years. So how did this general cum bodyguard end up patriarch of one of history's most iconic dynasties? How did he father an empire and lineage which culminated in the legendary Cleopatra herself? To understand this, we must return briefly to the years preceding the partition of Babylon, to Ptolemy's role in Alexander's campaigns. Ptolemy of Lagos had won great favour as a general under Alexander, playing pivotal roles in battles across Greece, Afghanistan, India, Anatolia and Bactria. He even led the final assault against Bessas, or Artaxerxes V, the former satrap of Bactria and the self-proclaimed King of Kings of Persia, with a forced cavalry march and successful capture of the enemy. So it was that Ptolemy held significant status by the time of the posthumous partition of Alexander's empire, where the various leading groups who had formed Alexander's high command hotly debated who would succeed the dead emperor, even as his body lay warm in its deathbed. The debate soon became an armed standoff, but eventually it was decided that the Macedonian Empire would be jointly ruled by Alexander's half-brother, Philip Aridaeus, and his son, Alexander IV. But since Aridaeus was intellectually disabled and Alexander IV just a newborn child, the general Perdikas ultimately became regent of the empire, Epimeletes ton Basilikon. And amidst the power plays of the other Diadochi, and especially Perdikas grasping for supremacy, Ptolemy, as a subsequent partition council at Babylon, simply asked for the satrapy of Egypt, and all those present agreed. In doing so, he seized upon an opportunity few others saw. Rather than strike out at huge swathes of Alexander's empire like the other Diadochi, he instead chose a smaller yet wealthy and stable province which he could consolidate and expand. So Ptolemy then led his army to Egypt and took over as its satrap in the name of Philip Aridaeus and Alexander IV. But leaving little time for the dust to settle, he moved to conquer Cyrenaica, swiftly expanding his satrapy's borders. Now confident from his base in Egypt, Ptolemy made his first real move to gain an advantage over the other Diadochi. Before his death, Alexander had expressed his wish to be buried at the temple of Zeus Amon in Libya. But Perdikas and some other generals decided he'd be transported for burial back in Macedon instead. So, Ptolemy, in a move as bold as they come, sent out troops to intercept it as it moved through Syria. This was successful, and he was able to bring Alexander's body all the way back to Egypt, eventually building a great tomb for him in its new capital, Alexandria. While until this point Ptolemy had been comparatively reserved in his interactions with the other Diadochi, he now freely committed himself to the faction against Perdikas. He even executed his own deputy, Cleomenes, on suspicion of spying for Perdikas, and absorbed a massive wealth of 8,000 talents of gold as a result. This was enough to lure Perdikas out in open war against Ptolemy in Egypt. 
but his effort was a crushing defeat. Perdiccas' men mutinied and killed him for such a disgrace. Following Ptolemy's victory, the other Diadochi offered him the title of Epimeletes, or regent, but following his policy of consolidation, he refused it and continued to strengthen Egypt. This policy served him well in the coming years. He went on to conquer Cyprus, Syria and Judea. He personally led fleets in naval battle which took Anatolian coastline from Antigonus, another famous Diadoch, and thereon conquered swathes of Greece. He even sent so much assistance to the besieged city of Rhodes that they gave him the divine epithet Sorter, or Saviour, which he would forever after be remembered as Ptolemy I Sorter. In a subsequent give-and-take series of wars between the Diadochi involving concessions and conquers, Ptolemy emerged with his power base around Egypt secure, and himself soundly recognised as one of, if not the most powerful, of Alexander's successors. In addition to his military campaigns, Ptolemy was also busy on his home front, forging together a Greco-Egyptian culture to last the ages. He introduced a cult of Alexander early in his reign to establish himself as the conquering emperor's heir, and then established the cult of the god Serapis, a deity inspired by the Greek gods, but dressed like those of the Egyptians. And he levied his authority over the Egyptians as their satrap with confidence, with one inscription in 311 BCE having him state, I, Ptolemy the satrap, I restore to Horus, the avenger of his father, the lord of Pei, and to Buto, the lady of Pei and Dep, the territory of Patanut, from this day forth forever with all its villages, all its towns, all its inhabitants, all its fields. He officially restyled himself king instead of satrap in 305 BCE, and by 303 BCE was considered pharaoh of Egypt, with his wives Eurydice and Berenike considered queens. He was widely tolerant of the native Egyptian culture, even if he never learned the language himself, and he forced neither Greek nor even Macedonian mores upon his kingdom. And while there would always be a Hellenistic elite who spoke and governed in Greek in the upper echelons of Ptolemaic Egyptian society, Egyptians and Greeks alike flourished together. Ptolemy died at the incredible age of 84 in retirement, having written his memoirs and left behind an empire marked out by its military success and cultural achievements. He was a man who had travelled the length and breadth of the known world with Alexander, a man who had toppled his foes, aided his friends, lived as a hero king, and died as a god.